Hello, my name is Bogdana Nyamtsu and this is module number 4, Social Sustainability. In this course, we are going to address two interrelated concepts, quality of life and well-being, and we are going to discuss them from the perspective of the role of sociology and other fields in their development and better definition. A question that I think that we need to answer is who is studying quality of life and well-being? I am asking this question because these two concepts are placed at the intersection of a variety of sciences or fields. And it is important to look from an evolutionary perspective which field or fields have contributed the, the, the most to the development of such studies and what's the future of them. Based on the literature, there are authors who argue that from an evolutionary perspective, we have a couple of fields that have contributed to the development of quality of life and well-being studies. Thus, Initially, discussion of quality of life and well-being within the academic literature centers on the healthcare field, including nursing, medicine, and health promotion. Also, psychology literature on quality of life forms a large subset of the healthcare literature. Also, quality of life can be said to be a subject of academic debate in economics particularly in the related field of happiness studies, a research area shared with psychologists and sociologists. Some of the topics addressed include the effect of medical interventions on quality of life or subjective well-being of individuals or groups of individuals with shared characteristics. Also, quality of life and well-being are currently linked to the social indicators movement, which developed in both Scandinavia and the US in the 1960s and 1970s, out of a feeling that economic indicators alone could not reflect the quality of life of population. Governments are now interested to measure and compare changes in quality of life within and between communities, cities, regions, and nation-states. Quality of life emerged as an academic discipline in its own a little bit later, in the 1970s, with the help of two peer-reviewed scientific journals. The name of the two journals are Social Indicators Research and Journal of Happiness Studies. One of the questions that we are trying to answer is also concerning the role of sociology in advancing research in this area. Subjective well-being is not a great issue in sociology. Authors argue that there are pragmatic, ideological and theoretical reasons for that lack of interest. Some pragmatic reasons include the fact that sociologists are more interested in what people do than in how they feel. Sociology is more about collectivities, whereas subjective well-being is an individual level concept. It has to do how people, individuals, perceive their life. Among the ideological reasons, in the literature, we find that many sociologists are committed to notions of objective well-being, such as social equality and social cohesion. Discrepancy between objective conditions and how people feel are rapidly labeled as desirability-based bias or false consciousness. Among theoretical reasons, we can state that sociologists usually tend to think of subjective well-being as a mere idea that depends 
on social comparison with variable standards and that is therefore a whimsical state of mind not worth pursuing and studying. It is important to understand the involvement of sociology in this field but also the fact that uh, certain preoccupations are currently changing and evolving toward more interest in subjective well-being. How can we define quality of life? Similar to other broad concepts used in a variety of fields, there is not a great deal of consensus. There is a broad variety of definition. In one study, it is estimated that, that we have more than a hundred different definitions. Numerous scholars writing in the area of quality of life are attempting to categorize definitions. Thus far, we can say that there are four broad categories or types of definitions based on the table presented on the next slide. Please take a look at the table and see that we have global definitions, which are the most common general type of definitions. They usually say little about the possible com components of quality of life. Instead, they incorporate ideas of satisfaction, dissatisfaction, or happiness, unhappiness. We then have component definitions, which try to break down quality of life into a series of components, dimensions, or domains, or identify characteristics deemed essential to any evaluation of quality of life. The third category of definitions are the so-called focus definitions, which refer only to one or a small number of the dimensions of quality of life. The four categories are the combination or the hybrid definitions, which are global definitions that also specify dimension. Other definitions, besides the ones included in the previous table, they try to describe the attributes of quality of life. If you examine this table, included on the slide carefully, you will see that various authors point toward different attributes. For example, Haas, in a 1999 study, points toward the fact that we have an evaluation of an individual's current life circumstances. It's multidimensional, it is multidimensional, it's value-based and dynamic, comprise subjective as well as objective indicators and it's most reliably measured by subjective indicator by persons capable of self-evaluation. There are a couple of main debates in the area of quality of life literature. The first debate has to do with whether we should use subjective versus objective approaches. This is somewhat similar to our discussion in a previous class about whether we should measure urban sustainability based on subjective indicators or objective ones. Some of the frequently used objective social indicators include life expectancy, crime rate, unemployment rate, GDP, poverty, school attendance, working hours per day or week, or suicide rate. These are all indicators that we have concrete data and data that are collected by various governmental agencies or institutes. On the other hand, we have subjective social indicators and they are based on individual appraisal and evaluation of social conditions. Some of the most frequently used ones include sense of community, 
material possessions, sense of safety, happiness, satisfaction with life as a whole, relationships with family, job satisfaction, sex life, perception of distributional justice, uh, hobbies and club memberships. Usually, the subjective data do not exist and not collected on a regular basis by governmental agencies and they need to be collected when we are interested in obtaining them. This dichotomy between subjective and objective indicators can also bring us to very controversial questions such as can people who live in poverty still be happy? What's the connection between well-being, quality of life and poverty? And why are we interested in well-being in development studies? The text box that's included on the slides gives you a few details about these issues and how we can answer the question that I asked at the beginning of the slide. Another debate in the quality of life literature deals with whether or not we should have unidimensional or multidimensional understanding of the concept. There are efforts made in the literature to identify core dimensions of the quality of life. In the table included on the slide, we have a couple of core quality of life areas or domains, such as emotional well-being, interpersonal relations, material well-being, personal development, physical well-being, self-determination, social inclusion, and rights. For each of them, we have provided indicators and descriptors for each indicators. Another important question in the quality of life studies is whether this concept can be cross-cultural. In other words, can we take a survey of quality of life developed in one country and apply it without any changes in a different context? In the literature, what is considered a good life varies between individuals and between different societies and cultures. It may be therefore misleading to take a conception of quality of life developed in one cultural context and apply it to other cultures, or even within ethnic communities within a given geographic areas. For example, in the field of healthcare, as a result of an increased international cooperation, the demand for cross-culturally applicable patient-oriented instruments to assess the need for and to evaluate the outcome of medical interventions has also grown. However, basic problems exist in assessing health-related quality of life across cultures. Conceptually, it is unclear to which extent the quality of life construct is transferable from one cultural context to another. Methodologically, ways to assess the, constru the construct have to be sensitive to different cultures and practically, application of quality of life measures may be difficult. Some of the problems include translation, psychometric testing and norming of quality of life questionnaires. All of these problems have been identified based, as I said, on efforts to develop questionnaires that are transferable across various contexts. Please take a look at this slide because we are now trying to see how we can measure quality of life. As in the case of sustainable development measurement, we have different metrics developed 
by a variety of international organizations. In Deep's case, we have major international organizations interested in measuring certain aspects of quality of life and well-being across countries. On this slide, I have included one table which basically looks to how OECD is measuring inequality. And you can see both subjective and objective indicators being used for this. On the next slide, you can see the framework for measuring well-being and progress also designed by OECD, where you can see all the dimensions of quality of life as designed by OECD. Another organization involved in developing metrics applicable at international level is the European Commission, which developed a set of 8 plus 1 indicators on quality of life. The dimension included are material living conditions, productive or main activity, health, education, leisure and social interactions, economical and physical safety, governance and basic rights, natural and living environment, overall experience of life. I would like to share with you a research project that I was part of, and this has to do with how quality of life is measured in the city of Cluj-Napoca. Romania, and it's measured mostly during the strategic planning process which took place in 2014. At the local level, quality of life was defined based on existing metrics at the international level. So the team that was involved in the process of strategic planning and also in the development of quality of life index proposed an index with eight categories, self-evaluation of the quality of life, safety, health, education, environment, quality of governments, and economic prosperity. On the right, uh, you can see, for example, the indicators that are part of the self-evaluation of the quality of life. I will offer you a couple of the main findings that resulted from the application of the quality of life questionnaire to the residents of the city of Cluj-Napoca in 2014. And it's interesting to see which of the factors that influence self-evaluation of quality of life and level of satisfaction got the highest scores. We have family life, housing, health and social life. And for example, general economic situation received a lot lower score. Other conclusions, for example, include the fact that citizens have more trust in local authorities than in the central government. Local public services with high level of customer satisfaction are public transportation, transportation child protection and education. Local public services with lower levels of satisfaction include health insurance and public health services and the pension system. It has to be said that uh, these services with low levels of satisfaction are systems or areas where the local authorities cannot do 
a lot. They are mostly the responsibility of the central government. Despite the general high level of satisfaction, only 13% of respondents spend a lot of time doing pleasant activities. Optimist, optimism and happiness are evaluated, self-evaluation actually rather high, 7.32 and 7.91 out of 10. We have to ask ourselves, why is quality of life important? Why are municipalities, as well as residents, trying to see how various cities are doing in terms of quality of life? For example, an increasing number of firms are seeking locations that will attract and retain a well-educated workforce and those areas with cultural and recreational activities could have a competitive advantage. Quality of life is becoming increasingly important in modern business location decisions, particularly in the high technology sectors. IT companies, which can locate virtually anywhere, are interested in finding places with good quality of life. Quality of life, according to one study, is clearly one factor considered in location decisions, along with other factors such as job availability. As I, as I announced in the beginning of the class, well-being is the other concept that we want to explore a little bit together with uh, quality of life. We are going to focus first on a couple of definitions. Well-being, similar to quality of life, suffers from the same type of definitional problems. It is vague and it is at the intersection of a, of a variety of disciplines. The field of happiness economics um, defines the concept of subjective well-being as life satisfaction and it can be both unidimensional, satisfaction with life in general, or multidimensional, satisfaction with different aspects or domains of life. It is not all the authors that make a distinction between quality of life and well-being. Some regard the two terms as interchangeable, while others regard well-being as one component of the broader concept of quality of life. On the table, in the table included on this slide, I have provided a few definitions as derived from the literature and I would be tempted to say based on these definitions that well-being is perceived as part of the broader concept of quality of life. For example, the first definition states that well-being is the individual's experience or perception or how, of how well he or she lives is taken as the criterion of quality of life. A second definition states subjective well-being research is concerned with individual subjective experience of their own lives. Some of the concluding remarks about quality of life and well-being can be described as elusive concepts. They both include an objective and a subjective dimension. Traditionally, the focus was on objective factors. Now, there is a transition towards subjective ones. They are important because they can be related, for example, to city competitiveness. Decisions regarding business location are made also based on such aspects. Subjective well-being can act as motivator for surpassing objective conditions which are less favorable. If you remember our question whether poor people can be happy.